And hi, everyone. It is such an honor to be joining you from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. If I may, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, and ideally, what I offer today might provoke, prod, and push you all in the outstanding work that you're doing um, across Scotland, but I also know folks are joining from other parts of the world. And of course, use the hashtag creative bravery for the amazingly creative, brave people who are leading this outstanding work. So just a few housekeeping notes. Obviously, we're on Zoom. I encourage you to take notes. There will probably, well, there certainly will be a few occasions when I will pause. Um, and I will ask you to turn on your video screen and maybe we can use the chat function to facilitate um, a little bit of conversation because I'd like to know who you are and what you're thinking. But um, it's also good to turn off your video and mute yourself um, when you see the slides because um, evidently that helps with the bandwidth. Um, as Paul noted, this bonfire session is being recorded and this was just a note to myself um, for whomever to press that record button. So let me begin again by saying hello and welcome to this bonfire. I am Greg. I'm the executive director of a private charitable foundation here in Pittsburgh called the Grable Foundation, which is in part the Rubbermaid fortune. We're de dedicated to improving the lives of children. And I'm also the founder and co-chair of a learning network called Remake Learning. Uh, as I noted, I'm joining you from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and, um, and there's my tag should you wanna follow. But really importantly, um, I have some deep Scottish roots and my mom's family is the McGill family. I'm a McGillivray um, dating back hundreds of years. And so um, I'm especially excited and in fact nervous, I think because of that, because I wanna do so well and write by you all because I'm just um, blown away by the incredible work that you're doing. In fact, we've been learning a lot from you and your colleagues in England and Scotland over these past few years. Um, from you at the Creative Bravery Festival and also uh, colleagues at the Big Education Conversation, Big Change and Innovation Unit. And to the extent that you haven't seen these two publications that originated last year out of London, one produced by Big Change called Reimagining Education Together and another called Local Learning Systems produced by Innovation Unit with support from WISE, I encourage you to take a look. Um, they're really fantastic publications as you think about learning and the future of learning in Scotland and beyond. And to be sure, we are learning from each other in all sorts of ways. And so this is my caveat to say, um, I will generously borrow from my colleagues at OpenIDEO in California, from my colleagues at KnowledgeWorks in Cincinnati, Ohio, from Brookings in Washington, DC, and from 100 in Helsinki, Finland. And today during this bonfire, um, ideally I tell a full, full, fourfold story. Um, one that gives context about lessons learned from my little corner of the world right now, um, because those lessons learned signal something about what's to come. And then I'll give you context for what remake learning is, because it's obviously critical to our story. And then looking ahead as to how we've been thinking about what it'll mean to remake tomorrow for our youth, our families and our educators, and then speak to some work that we've been trying to do that is clearly a very close cousin of all of you creatively brave, amazing people. An additional note, when I use the word educators, um, yes, you're gonna think of teachers in a pre-K through grade 12 setting, but I'm hopeful you also think of librarians and youth workers and early childhood educators and after school workers and all of the people who writ large are educators and are the caring adults and present in our kids' lives. And speaking of those kids in everything that we do, and I know that's true for you, I just hope that um, during this hour together, but also in all that we do, we put those kids in our heads and our hearts um, as motivation and purpose for why we do what we do. So wanting to know a little bit more about you, um, I'm asking you to use the chat function. I'm gonna turn off my slide in a moment, but if we get the chance to sit around this bonfire three years from now, five years from now, maybe two years from now, what, what will we say we did? That learners now do what? Which isn't the way we did things just a few years ago. So I'm gonna stop sharing. I would love to see your beautiful faces if possible, um, but please use the chat function um, so we got to, to hear from each of us.
that learners will think more critically and are much more independent in their learning. Thank you, Kenny. Liz, thank you, that, that learners think for themselves. A real sense of agency and um, that learners feel more included and heard, that they're leading with their learning. They, did, they decide how they're learning and what they're learning and know what, why they're learning. That learners feel excited about their learning, joyful and creative. Uh, that they now empower each other, that they wanna share their knowledge, that they go places in their learning we couldn't have imagined possible that they don't see learning just happening in schools, that the learners are now confident and comfortable with who they are. Keep these coming. And um, my Creatively Brave Festival folks, I hope you're capturing this because they're just beautiful ideas here that I'm hopeful you also will share in the festival playground. So if I may, I'm going to share my screen once again. So we return here to Pittsburgh. And um, as you know well, we've been navigating, much like you, twin pandemics in terms of COVID-19 and racism. And it's teaching a lot, us a lot of lessons that we, of which we need to be reminded and also new lessons about um, the terrible scourge of both poverty and racism. So if you allow, I want to share some lessons learned on our part, um, five lessons that um, of which we've been reminded and are learning again. The first lesson is the importance of field building and the unsexy work that happens year in, year out to build an infrastructure of support that supports learners, educators, and families. And we're fortunate here in the Pittsburgh region to have any number of what I'll describe as field building organizations, intermediary organizations that are supporting a whole range of schools and museums and libraries and others. Um, advocacy organizations like Allies for Children or subject specific organizations like the Arts Education Collaborative or the State of Black Learning. These really speak to the vibrancy of civil society and you all likely know well the critical role of NGO organizations in public policy and public policy matters here in America. And it's these very field building organizations together with government to be sure that have been critical to us over these past seven months. Thinking first about how we, in a remote learning setting, connect kids with devices and, and connectivity and the professional learning to support educators. And then the learning opportunities in summer that were squashed because of the pandemics and how to create virtual or hybrid opportunities for young people. And now, as kids head back to school in all different types of circumstances and contexts, how these field building organizations have been critical to the on-ramp to this very different school year. A second lesson learned, but you all know this really well, is that teachers rock. They simply rock. Um, and if we don't need evidence for that because we know that, but let me just point you back to the springtime, that between March and May here in Pittsburgh, nearly 10,000 educators availed themselves of learning opportunities to improve their own remote instructional practices. Again, it's field building organizations like in our case, the Allegheny Intermediate Unit and in something in particular called Transform Ed that enabled this to happen and to happen so quickly that those years of investment paid off in that exact moment. And in these two weeks in May, 3,500 teachers um, participated in peer learning with one another, led by teachers themselves about what was working and what was failing in schools. But it wasn't just in our schools. Those educators are in all sorts of settings. And just one example of how in a two week period leading up to the start of the school year, any number of NGO organizations came together with formal education to create virtual learning opportunities for young people. A third obvious lesson learned is the critical role of leadership. And it was incredible that in that um, March, April, May time period, the work that was done then to prepare school leaders and administrators for the 2020-21 school year, such that between mid-May and late June, there was, for example, an 11-part series about operational planning in schools and the things that school leaders and school boards need to do and to think about differently in preparation for the reopening of schools in whatever form 
in August and September. More than 500 administrators participated in this. And then in the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd, um, a group was able to work closely with the Pitt Ed Justice Collaborative at the School of Education at Pitt to really focus our attention on justice learning and what that means. A fourth lesson learned the critical importance of the entire village, of the cluster, of the ecosystem, of the entire community to raise our kids. And again, it was those investments in those field building organizations that enabled our community to quickly set up opportunities to help adults and parents and caregivers find childcare, to support arts learning at home, to provide family education hotlines for non-English speakers and so many other opportunities and how we support one another in this remarkable time. It was also all of this work that allowed us to put together nearly 5,000 what we call boxes of joy. Boxes full with chalk and sprinklers and bubbles and crayons and all sorts of other things that were delivered to young people and families in impoverished communities throughout the Pittsburgh region to bring some semblance of joy and childhood and playfulness and wonder to kids during this incredibly hard time. And again, it was this field building that enabled our Department of Human Services here in the County of Allegheny where Pittsburgh is located to work with any number of those field building organizations to create learning hubs that are now operating and located all across our city and in our in, uh, near in suburban, suburban locations to support parents, families, and caregivers in the variations of school while they can attend to the economic well-being of their families and their jobs while ensuring that their kids are in loving, caring spaces where great learning can happen. And then a fifth lesson learned, um, the critical role of parents, families, and caregivers. And we know from research at an organization called Learning Heroes that because of the experience in the springtime, more parents and caregivers feel better connected to what's happening in schools. They had to pay attention to what was happening in a different way than they did previous to March, mid-March when schools shut down. And because of that experience, nearly three quarters of parents expect to be differently engaged by their schools, by their teachers in these near times ahead. Well, that presents both an incredible opportunity and an incredible challenge as we think about that relationship between schools and families. And so, for example, in our region, we've worked closely with both local and national organizations like Learning Heroes, Common Sense out of California, PBS, our public broadcasting system out of Washington, DC, to create simple opportunities for parents to engage and, and to learn about how they might best support their young people during these times. So as I think about these lessons learned, there are certainly some bottom lines. And our colleagues at IDEO captured that so well. That is, first, that relationships come first. You know that. You've been doing that for years. We know that more than anything, relationships come first. We also know how oversaturated and overwhelmed our educators are and how we need to attend to the well-being of our educators as we're asking so much of them. We certainly know how inequities have been exacerbated. But the thing that really stands out for me in this list is that systems change isn't guaranteed. I'm really hopeful, in fact, that um, because of these times, we're going to, we have the opportunity to see real systemic change in the, in the near years ahead. But I'm also need to be reminded that that isn't guaranteed and there is so much work that needs to be done if in fact we want to see systems change in schooling and in education writ large. So we all have some lessons learned and uh, I've tried to share just five because they signal about where we need to be in the, the post-pandemic's future to which I'll turn in a bit. But here again is a moment when I'm going to uh, turn off my screen. I'm going to turn to you all and uh, I'm going to invite you to use the chat. But also, if you feel motivated, if you're feeling creatively brave and you want to unmute yourself and offer some comments, I invite you to do that too. So let's put ourselves in that situation again, sitting around this bonfire at three years from now. And what will you describe as your lessons learned from these times? 
that back in 2020, I learned or learned again what? So with that, I'm going to stop my sharing and invite you all to join me in conversation. To rethink education about the importance of how we need others, about listening and maybe listening differently to your students, about stopping and pausing. That's a lesson I feel like I'm learning every day <laughs> and doing badly sometimes. Forming new communities and forming connections, learning to relax a little more and, and to give yourself a break. Um, again, a lesson I'm trying to learn. The importance of patience. To let people know that you're here and available. The importance of community and communication. I would add to that storytelling. To stop and to notice. To notice and to wonder. Anyone feeling the creatively brave spirit that they want to join into the conversation with your voice? Please, I invite you to unmute. Hi, Greg, it's Julie Degnan here. Hi, Julie. Hi, I think um, what I've learned, I've, I've heard a lot of um, talks, particularly in the press, about how, you know, we need to close this gap that's appeared in learning and our young people have fallen behind and let's quickly get them caught up. But I, I think we need to turn that around and look at it positively and look at, you know, that what young people have been able to do, you know, particularly with their families, they've learned different things in different ways and to focus on the gap that's appeared is quite a negative thing and that's not to say that you know everything's been rosy because certainly you know that people have had a lot of adverse experiences but I think we need to look and, and see what they've actually learned and then make sure that we build on that. Yeah Julie you're so right I mean if you think about what young people have done and the opportunities that they have created for themselves and for their peers during these past seven months and how that should motivate us as adults and I would also look to the adults themselves. I, I have to admit, I, I used to get into the practice of saying, oh, like our schools haven't changed, they're stuck in an industrial age model. And how wrong I was to have perpetuated that myth because it is our teaching profession that year in, year out has been producing Teslas. And what other profession was as deft and nimble and creative during these past seven months and recreated itself other than the teaching profession. And so I think as we look to students themselves and be inspired and motivated by them, I would add to um, the brilliance of what you said also to the, um, the teachers in our profession and our field. Would anyone else like to come into this bonfire conversation? I love these notes. Small endeavors are just as powerful as the big ones. I'm a great big fan of small hacks. I actually think it's the, it's the little bits, it's the small hacks that are things that create the seed that lead to the big systemic change. It rarely happens in some great big grand moment of announcement, but rather in those small hacks and those small endeavors. I'll join your, uh, your conversation. Uh, it's Isabel Boat well. here. And um, if I'm sitting at the campfire three years from now and, and thinking back to 2020, then I think what 2020 has either taught me or I think it's probably likely reminded me that leadership is really important. And I don't mean in a hierarchical sense. Um, I think it's shown quite clearly in what we've come through or coming through that leaders need to have a clarity uh, when communicating. There needs to be an empathy, real yes. empathy. And there needs to be courageous decision making, because where we have found in, in any educational setting and beyond, where there has been difficulty, it's quite often down to lack of clarity, um, a bit of procrastination, uh, or a lack of empathy and understanding of um, individual teachers and individual groups of learners' circumstances. That's what I think I'll have learned. At the I really appreciate that. Thank you, Isabel. Um, I borrow from someone else, you know, we need to really think about leadership as a plaza. That yes, sometimes leadership comes from the headmaster or the school superintendent. But more often than not, it comes from the first grade teacher or the librarian or um, the crossing guard or all numbers of places. And, and we need to appreciate and notice that and support it. Maybe one more. Does anyone else want to come in?
I think for me, it's the, the, the you finding a tribe, like, you know, everybody here around the bonfire, that that's been so amazing. And sometimes as a, a lecturer that you can feel quite isolated if you're doing something that's different and been able to find like-minded people um, and, and realize how easy it is to do that, that one minute you're stuck in your dishwasher and the next we're with you in Pittsburgh, Greg, and, and that's been so uh, exciting and, and really, really inspiring. Thank you. I, um, I feel like I have met cousins all around the world, maybe especially so. I mean, this is the blessing of all of these Zoom meetings, right? But in, you know, whether it's in Taiwan or in India or in Scotland or in Colombia, um, just the, the kinship and how affirming that is to each of us. I mean, it, it really is a motivator um, because you find your people and it's incredibly affirming. So if I may, I'm going to again share my slide. I have to admit this might be a, a longer period of presentation. What I will um, try and do is um, tell a Pittsburgh story. And just to give you context, right? So Pittsburgh is, um, the metro region is probably about two, two and a half million. So about half the size of Scotland, but maybe two, two times the size of Edinburgh metro. So um, it'll give you, ideally you find some gems in here as you think about what it is that you wanna achieve in Scotland or wherever it is in the, is in the world that you are um, about our own story. So um, here we go, everyone. So um, I mentioned this learning network called Remake Learning. So Remake Learning didn't begin by a virtual, by a virtual bonfire, but it actually began over a series of breakfast meetings um, we talk fondly about meetings of 10 and 12 people that happened nearly um, uh, 13 years ago and over breakfast and pancakes began to identify not only educators, but also technologists and artists and gamers and others who were thinking about the future of learning in similar ways. And the question presented to us then was, well, what happens if these folks start bumping up against each other? And if we provide opportunities for people to connect as we think about the future of learning and what we need to do for our young people. It literally is a pancake breakfast that grew and grew and grew. And, um, and people started bringing their own frameworks and their own um, ways of thinking about learning to the fore. Um, when we think about science, technology, engineering, math, STEM learning, add the A for arts with STEAM learning youth media learning, maker-centered learning, connected learning. There are probably 29 phrases, if not 29 times 29 phrases, that we can use to describe the future of learning in different ways. But, and people were bringing their own educational interests to this group. It's a network that continued to expand over the years and was ultimately supported by an infrastructure such that by the 10-year mark, Remake Learning um, had become a network of more than 500 schools, museums, libraries, early learning centers, after school programs, creative industries, campuses of higher education, where there were thousands of people thinking commonly about the future of learning. And this is the official that we use to describe a network because a network, an ecosystem, a cluster, isn't anything like an organization. Um, and it isn't hierarchical. hierarchical. It's, um, it's very, or it's organic, but it's deliberately organic, and, 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 and there can be a remarkable structure to support that, as you have done. And it plays out in really tangible ways, ways that we support parents, families, and caregivers in learning settings, the ways that we construct new spaces in schools and other sites of learning, the ways that we support all sorts of young people in the future that they need and that we want for them. And so we describe Remake Learning as a network that ignites engaging, relevant, and equitable learning in support of young people navigating rapid social and technological change. It's a network in which annually there are thousands of educators involved, nearly 600 organizations at this point. Hundreds of spaces in our schools and otherwise have been reimagined and redesigned. And there are many dozens of peer-led professional learning communities among educators. Um, and I'm not asking you to read this map, but you can see it visually, those color-coded circles, how widespread in our region here in Pittsburgh, and Pittsburgh would be right at the, at the confluence of these three rivers. Um, the peer-led, teacher-led professional learning communities to support all of this. Now, to be sure, this has been supported by money 
and, um, and we're blessed in this region to have a lot of philanthropic capital. Um, Scotland's own Andrew Carnegie, I mean, uh, yeah, created American philanthropy right here in Pittsburgh. And we, we benefit mightily from um, philanthropic support um, such that grants have been made available to educators as they redesign spaces, as they take small chances, a first grade teacher working with a roboticist in a new way, or a librarian working with a designer in a new way. And throughout these nearly 15 years, we've distributed many millions of dollars, oftentimes in very small increments of $1,000, $2,500, $5,000 to support the experimentation in developmentally appropriate ways um, for our educators and what they're trying to accomplish in their classrooms, libraries, and elsewhere. We've also been able to create all sorts of regional working groups so that, Helena, you can find your people, right? If, if your interest is personalized learning and that's the way that you think about the world, you can connect with your colleagues or in Youth Voice or in Maker-Centered Learning. CS stands for Computer Science for Pittsburgh PGH. Um, we've tried to create under the umbrella of remake learning, homes where people can find themselves and their interests, but they also are under the umbrella of remake learning. So if you, you've walked through the personalized learning door, you might meet all of those STEM and STEAM people. You might meet those youth voice working group people and all of those ideas start bumping up against each other. So much of this work has been documented in any number of publications that are freely available at remakelearning.org. And we've also worked with international partners like 100 out of Finland um, to help put a spotlight on, on the incredible and amazingly brave educators in our region. Um, always thinking about these kids and about the futures that they want for themselves and about the futures that we can design and shape for them. Critical to this work has been thinking about what is it that we want for learners. And in our region, hundreds of educators representing lots of different schools, museums, and libraries came together to ultimately put these words together about the learners that we want to cultivate and nurture here in this corner of the world. Now, wonderfully, a lot of our schools and, um, and other sites of learning now have graduate profiles and other exercises that they've done to help articulate the comprehensive whole child nature um, that they're by which they're approaching their work and remake learning is is most you know very especially thinking about the range of places where young people learn yes schools are critical but they spend only 14 to 20 percent of their waking hours in a school building and how do we capture all of those other places at home and online or in libraries or museums or clubs and all of the places where young people are learning so as we think about what it is that we want for our learners. Um, what does it mean to support them so that they become active critical thinkers and problem solvers? What does it mean to support them such that they really start to question, examine, and dissect the very systems that are challenged and, 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 and creating problems for them? How do they connect in all the places that they learn? And how do we connect them better their communities? Always mindful of things that are timeless and classic like deep and caring relationships. In this work, we've been especially attentive to those who are marginalized. And for us in our region, we've identified that in a five-fold way. And it's been important for us not only to say that we are committed to diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, but to specifically name what we mean by that and then to direct support and resources in support of learners um, in these categories. Learners in poverty, learners of color, learners in our rural areas, girls in the sciences, and um, learners with disabilities. Um, we've recently changed that phrasing to say learners with disabilities. So you can connect with Remake Learning in any number of ways on your favorite social media platform. And I should note that um, about six years ago, it was the uh, Obama White House, and in particular, the Office of Science and Technology Policy, in which a lot of the innovative educational work was happening in that White House, um, turned to us in Pittsburgh and said, hey, Pittsburgh, um, there's clearly something going on there. How do you capture it in a way that helps your own efforts, but might be instructive to Fremont, California, or to Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina? And so we produced a playbook that if you Google Remake Learning Playbook, you will find um, any number of publications, case studies, and really a lot of our lessons learned. 
and other communities across the United States and even in places like Christ Church New Zealand have taken this playbook and, and created their own learning ecosystems that, that just crush those boundaries of school and really create dynamic learning and are on the road to creating dynamic learning ecosystems. So as we look ahead, just like you, we've been navigating all these pandemics and we've had tremendous questions and worries and concerns, but also some hopefulness as well, right? And I wanna turn again to our colleagues at IDEO because they often capture words so well. And it was our, our colleagues at IDEO who presented five questions that have really resonated for me personally. What if this moment, what if this were the moment that equity really, really, really took center stage? And what would that mean? And how do we support that? And what does it mean to be anti-racist? What if we thought entirely differently about time and bent time to better, need, better meet the needs of students? What if we thought about families as an incredible force in education? And, and if we supported parents, families, and caregivers differently to be remarkable education and learning allies? What, if it mean, what would it mean to continue to just bust these boundaries of learning beyond school? What would that look like? How would we support that? And then what if this really, 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 really is our chance to achieve systems change? Thinking back to that question and, and that comment that systems change isn't guaranteed. What is it that we need to do right now, despite all of these challenges, despite what's right in front of us, and do the work now so that years from now, ideally a few years from now, we'll begin to see some genuine, remarkable change. So just like you, we've asked all of these questions. And back in early May, Remake Learning partnered with KnowledgeWorks out of uh, Cincinnati, Ohio. And if you're not familiar with KnowledgeWorks, I encourage you to take a look at their work. Among other things, over many years, they have produced these forecasts about the future of learning. And, um, and it's not a crystal ball, but rather looks at signals in our lives that suggest scenarios that are plausible as we think ahead. And in fact, our colleagues at KnowledgeWorks talk not only about the inbound change that's happening to us, but really profoundly, um, Julie, to your earlier comment, the outbound change, the things that we can shape and make and create as we think about navigating what's in front of us. And they use this, um, this graph that I just love to, to those signals from the past and the present, how they project something about what's ahead. And there are preferred futures as we think about those, those scenarios. And what is the work that we can do to shape as best as possible how we get to those preferred futures? So, Remake Learning and working with KnowledgeWorks identified three principles that we wanted to use as we thought about this work. And we defined them in this way. The first principle was justice. And how is it that we commit to helping every learner, family, and community flourish and dismantle barriers and really attend to learners of greatest need and work alongside them, valuing their experiences and supporting and honoring their voices, strength, and dignity. A second principle for us was that timeless and classic role of relationships. And how might we think differently about supporting relationships in this time period? And how do we negotiate those power dynamics? And how, to your earlier comments in the chat, do we think differently about engaging and listening to students and then acting upon what it is that we're hearing? A third principle for us was methods. And how do we, what are the methods that we need to employ to arrive at a preferred future scenario? I wanna to turn to you in a little bit about your own ideas. But I will tell, to you, tell you of the nearly 100 people that were involved in this process with KnowledgeWorks, I, of course, came into it with my own questions. And this is far too much text on any PowerPoint slide. Someone would yell at me somewhere. But these were my questions, right? What if we swapped our focus on education for a focus on learning instead? And I shared this in the um, playground here for the Creative Bravery Festival. And what if our departments of learning became, our departments of education rather, became departments of learning. Much like here domestically in the United States, our departments of public welfare became departments of human services, which prompted a different way of thinking about systems, prompted a different way about thinking about public budgets. What would that mean if we thought about ed, not only education, but which conveys a real sense of schooling, but learning? 
A second question for me was, how do we better leverage the learning sciences? You know, it feels naive to say it in 2020, but when this work started with Remake Learning nearly 15 years ago, I have to admit, I didn't realize and recognize and appreciate the remarkable research coming out of places like Carnegie Mellon University, right here in my own backyard, or MIT, or the University of Washington, and all that we were learning about learning itself. And how do we better apply that remarkable learning in the design of our curriculum, in the design of our professional development, in the design of museum exhibits or summer camp experiences. And a third question for me goes back to how do we continue to bust these barriers of, of schooling and all other learning and really just blend it in and out of school, pre-K to, K, um, to grade 12 and beyond, and really think about the systems, the clusters and network that support families. As we did this work, we thought about our elements of a preferred future and the blue um, what's in blue identifies things that were happening here already already um, for years about the ways that we had centered whole child education and really put learners at the center of our work and the red recognized things that we felt we needed to especially bring to the fore in a way that maybe we hadn't done so or had done so poorly and so how do we think about, for example, learners of color and the systemic harms that have been done and what does it mean to be anti-racist? How do we think about personalized or competency-based learning? How do we think even more boldly about what it means to be flexible around time and space? Ultimately, this led to a publication, but of course it doesn't end with a publication, it ends with the work. And this publication is available, but I just want, I want to cite to you three examples of ideas that we thought about and, and said, how could we realize things and bring new things into the world? How do we think about the role of community alongside established leadership and elected boards in supporting education and really engage community and voices continuously in the improvement and design of public education? What if schools had full-time directors of relationship? that really focused on helping all students build the social capital that we know is so critical to their future opportunities. You know, 10 years ago, it was a complete anathema to have directors of instructional innovation. There probably isn't a school district in our region now that doesn't have such a director position. Well, what if we had directors of relationships and how could they attend to the whole being of our learners? And how do we think differently about portfolios and micro-credentialing and other opportunities? And in fact, things that this region has wrestled with for years and, and um, hasn't yet um, found the right solutions for our circumstances and our context. So asking all sorts of questions about the, what the future of learning might bring. If I may, I'm gonna to turn to you in a moment, but I wanna jump ahead because earlier this year, pre-pandemics, we launched, a, we designed a campaign called Tomorrow, really thinking about, as we think about our region's work to reimagine education and learning, how do we continue to deepen a mindset and behavior about what learning might be and how to get to it um, in our work? And so um, this campaign launched in May, so we didn't imagine it was gonna launch in the midst of a pandemic. And it's a campaign that we've have said, what calls us to forge a future where every day holds promise, no matter what tomorrow might bring? And if you'll allow, I just wanna play this brief video that speaks to the campaign. You've probably been thinking about the future a lot lately, about how our world is changing, about whether a robot could do your job, about how the way you get to work or shop for food or unwind at the end of the day is changing. About what kind of a world future generations will inherit. We've made it through uncertain tomorrows before. That's because we've never stopped wondering and we've never given up hope. Today, we know more than we ever have about how to solve problems about how our brains develop, about how to stay grounded in what makes us human while exploring the frontiers of what humans can make. The future holds tremendous promise. Promise that we can find the potential inside any learner. Promise 
that together we can nurture that potential in each and every child. Promise that we can let loose the brilliance of an entire generation. That future is closer than you think. But to make a better tomorrow, we have to act today. Let's forge a future that holds promise for every young person. Let's connect timeless ideas with new ways of learning. Let's prepare for what comes next, no matter what tomorrow brings. Learn more at remakelearning.org slash tomorrow. I hope you can all appreciate um, why I feel such, uh, you know, kids met with you all and such relationship because I, I feel like I could so easily pull out those logos and add creative bravery because of the extraordinary work that you're doing and how you're thinking about tomorrow and the tomorrow that you want to cross a Scotland and in other parts of the world. This is a campaign that's now reached more than 25,000 people, more than 25 million impressions. Um, it's a campaign that's um, been supported by extensive storytelling in our local media, by new publications and, uh, and existing publications, by all sorts of online conversations and events, by a series of grants totaling, uh, at this point, nearly $2 million, and will be supported by some upcoming events to which you are all invited, a celebration of educators set for October 5th, the national launch of an event called Remake Learning Days Across America and happening in 16 cities across America that launches on October 13th and October 20th event that's really pushing the boundaries of learning science and technology. It's, um, you can find all of the information about the Remake Tomorrow campaign at um, remakelearning.org slash tomorrow. You all have um, tremendous ideas and I know because I've been following them in, in some of the events I've been able to attend and the playground um, that I've been able to navigate. And I'm hopeful that in our last few minutes, we can um, take a moment to talk because as we think about this work, we often cite local icon, Fred Rogers, who's a pioneer of children's television here in America. And he said this, often when you think you're at the end of something, you're at the beginning of something else. There's no doubt that we're at the beginning of something else and we genuinely have the opportunity to shape that. And I know that you all, together with us and others, are gonna be the ones who will shape that. So, I'm hopeful to hear from some of you about some of your ideas and that hopefulness and um, your, your boundary-breaking um, thoughts as we look ahead. Greg, do you mind if I, I jump in and ask a question that's an observation that sort of, like we're all in the WhatsApp team, so we're all chatting as we're listening to all these presentations. And what we're noticing, that there's, there's obviously key themes that are emerging, that the need for creativity, change. And I think what your story has demonstrated really well is that change needs modelled. And so your screens where you started with like six people meeting for pancakes, and then it went to nine, then it went to 13. What you modelled was another way of working. So change came from pancakes rather than politics. And it, 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 I would imagine, but I would like you to sort of talk about it, is that it challenges the way that the sort of traditional format of way things work. So the, the man, the white man, probably sits at the top and he will make a decision that's disseminated and, and it will go like this and it'll go like this. But what you did, you said, well, we're going to take action by having pancakes together and not knowing what those pancakes did. Yeah. So the instant gratification of the white man at the top saying, do all this and everything will be fine, which is ridiculous, is gone. And you said, well, we're going to model something else. And it's going to take us like 16, 17 years. But where we get to is going to be much better than where we would have if we hadn't. And I, I, so that you, you're, I thought what your story did is like you talked, that was about the transition period, which is really interesting for us about how that happens. I wondered if you could talk a wee bit more about that. Yeah, well, it goes back to Isabel's comment earlier, right? Um, look, sometimes you make yourself lucky. And I, you know, I would be foolish if I sat here and told you that we had grand designs of investing. I mean, if you had told me that we had 13, 14, 15 years of work ahead, I would have said, oh, maybe not me. Um, but, um, you know, it really does begin. I, I'm a great big believer in, in little bits and small hacks. And, and those are the things that lead to change. Um, and, it, and I've seen it happen repeatedly. And I'll just give you a very concrete example. 
I saw in a local school district called the Elizabeth Ford School District. Not a well-resourced district, probably about 50% of the kids in that district um, receive free and reduced priced lunches because of, of where they fall in economically. And they made a change about seven years ago in one classroom, one classroom in their high school. And that classroom, they worked with Carnegie Mellon University because they had visited the Entertainment Technology Center. And the superintendent had seen that space and said like, oh, this isn't a future that we're preparing our kids for, but like, what do we do? And they spent probably less than $10,000 and, and, and employed their like custodians and things to paint the walls, but they redesigned this space and worked with CMU. And in that first year, they had hundreds of kids attend, wanting to attend classes in that space because they wanted to be in that space. They were motivated differently. I mentioned that to say that was a little, little hack. And there's so much more to the story, but I can tell you all these years later that this is a district that's seen remarkable change in, its, um, in, in, in traditional measures of its reading and math scores. It's the sort of thing that um, they've seen their dropout rates go from say 30 kids a year to now zero or one, all because they really attended to the culture of that school and the space and the communications and, uh, across with parents, the support for teachers, and have redesigned a space where the educators, kids, and families want to be. And in fact, all sorts of, of families have left charter schools and other things to return to the public school. I mentioned that as an example because um, that really started with a high school teacher. Yes, the superintendent was involved, but it goes back to the idea of leadership as a plaza, that those pancake breakfasts, it wasn't a group of 12 CEOs. It was, um, it was people in different levels of position and leadership. And that's one thing that we have learned repeatedly, right? I mean, sometimes change happens. If I think of another school district called the Allegheny Valley School District, do you know where their work to reimagine education started? With the physical education teacher in the middle school, who's now the director of instructional innovation all these years later for that school. But um, it's being open to recognizing that leadership comes in lots of places, which is why, quite frankly, small amounts of money you know, small catalytic grants have remained critical, you know, even 14, 15 years into this work because it continuously allows for experimentation, but allows people also to, um, to bring themselves in simple ways. I hope that, that was responsive, Paul. And um, so uh, thanks a lot for being part of the festival. Um, we love being part of your tribe. Um, thank you, Greg. Uh, and we'll see you goodbye. Thank you. I'm so grateful for this opportunity.